Welcome to the online teaching ministry of Pastor Rob Ginter and Farmdale Baptist Church. For more content, visit us online at farmdalebaptist.com. There used to be monsters in the upstairs of my parents' house, if, if you're curious. And, well, and, and I would run through the, the hall, and the monsters would be on the left, and I would just jump into the bed, put the blankets over me, because monsters are no match for blankets. <laughs> uh, that is something that uh, I think we all can agree on, uh, that the blankets make the monsters go away. Uh, it, might have been, uh, it might have had something to do with uh, what I watched before bed. Sometimes I'd, I'd get, I'd, I used to watch uh, Nick at Night, Get Smart, stuff like that. If you all know anything about Get Smart. Uh, but I used to watch that before I bed. Sometimes I would stay up late, though. Um, maybe my parents thought I was big enough. Uh, so I stayed up late and I watched things with them. And you know what they watched? America's Most Wanted. <laughs> America's Most Wanted. And, and when, I, when I say that, you hear the guy's voice in your head. You know the guy. And you hear the guy. So uh, they'd watch Rescue 911, America's Most Wanted, stuff like that. And the problem was we'd watch the show and then I'd run up, they'd be, you know, it'd be like, this is my childhood, right? Like watch America's Most Wanted and go, up, go to bed by yourself up in the dark. Go on, son. You know, like I'd, I'd run because I would see the guy's face in, my, in, my, in the empty bedroom to the left. And I'd, I'd, I'd jet, all of a sudden it'd be like, I'm sure they're sitting down there and they're like, go on to bed. And, and who, who knows what they did when I did that, but I, I'd go upstairs and all of a sudden they'd hear like footsteps, little footsteps thumping through the hallway on the upstairs. And you guys might think I'm irrational for, for, for thinking that, but uh, one episode of America's Most Wanted, I'll never forget it because they would have actors that go on there and the actors would portray the actual people. And there was a little boy on there being portrayed, and his mom, and they were our next door neighbors. They were the victims. They were our neighbors. So that's why I wasn't rational, irrational when I was going upstairs and I was running through the bed. I mean, they got them, they might come here. And why? Why is that? Why is there like the pressure on that when you see your neighbors on America's Most Wanted? I mean, the, on the bright side, they were the victims and not the perpetrators. You know what I mean? Like that's the, 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 the good thing about it is like they weren't perpetrating upon people. But the issue with that is that danger close is worse than danger afar. Right? Danger close is worse than danger afar. And thinking about the issues of being a Christian and those that we face and, and the conflicts and battles that we face, the problem is it's, it's actually, sometimes it's worse to be close to being a Christian because you're the most dangerous. You're the most moral and the most dangerous person is the one that's just kind of close, close to doing it, close to being it. What kind of person are we talking about here? The merely religious. The merely religious person. Because there's a conflict, and the danger is there in the conflict close to Christianity. So the danger is not far. The danger is near. And horseshoes, hand grenades, something counts in both. Does anybody know what counts in horseshoes and hand grenades? Close. Close only counts in those things. Just want to know if there's any rednecks of a certain age in the room. So thank you so much. I'm glad we're here together. Praise the Lord for us. Close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. It doesn't count in Christianity. It doesn't count with God. In fact, close is normally worse. It's normally worse. We see that in Acts 25 and 26. As the gospel is on trial, 
The attack wasn't far-fetched and far off. No, it was close, right? These are religious people coming back. And that's where we get our main point today from the text, that the mission of Jesus and the merely religious cannot peacefully coexist. The mission of Jesus and mere real, uh, religiosity, is what we'll call it, cannot peacefully coexist. Those two are always at war. That is what happens here in Acts 25 and 26. Because uh, as we left off a couple weeks ago before Pastor Jonathan's dynamic sermon, uh, we, we uh, saw last week, we, Paul is still in custody. He's still in trial. So counting his sermon in the week before that, and last week, we, several weeks here, the, the apostle is in custody prison or jail, and the gospel is on trial. And what's happening here is how long has he been in jail? Right? How long has you, have you been at that restaurant? Well, our waitress took, got off work and they brought another one. How long has Paul been in prison? Well, there was one governor and they brought another governor. So there's now a new governor. Felix left him in prison and he's now replaced by Festus. Felix it's not the name of a cat, but is the name of a, the governor. And the governor was deposed for being incompetent. He was recalled for incompetence. And the Festus is the guy that replaced him. So he's been in prison for two years. He's, now Festus is here in Acts 25 in the portion that we look at today. And he's been on a job for about three days. And he's met with a delegation who brings up the charges against Paul. So verse uh, three in chapter 25 says they began to try to get Paul moved again so that they could ambush him. If you remember in, in the previous weeks that led up to this, they tried to get the prisoner moved so they can find him vulnerable in that motion and to overcome him and to kill him. So two years later, the hatred still burns. The hatred still burns of the merely religious and the missionary of the gospel, Paul. The hatred still burns hot. And this time, their request to move Paul is flat out denied by Governor Festus, who decides to go down to Caesarea to hear the charges against him. And he protests his innocence, Paul does, in verse 11. But in the hand... So, Festus is handing him over to Agrippa in this passage. Agrippa uh, admits in 25.25 that Paul has done nothing to deserve death. Paul realizes this when he's asked about finishing the trial in Jerusalem, and he appeals to Caesar. He appeals to Caesar. So what, what's happening here, why would, he, why would he not want to go back to Jerusalem? Why would he want to appeal to Caesar? I don't all the way know, but when thinking through it, maybe the reason is he wants to take the gospel to Rome. Or another reason, an additional reason, could be that he doesn't trust the, a hung jury there in Jerusalem. And if they take him back there, he just not, doesn't want to die yet. And if they take him back there, they know that he's going to have an unfair trial uh, for desecrating the temple punishable by death, and they are going to bring it on. So that's what he does, and that's assuming he's not going to get assassinated along the way. So in this transfer to Caesar, Paul then goes to Agrippa that we're going to see in chapter 26. But the overall theme of this is people who are religious, Chapter 25, the religious delegation come against the Apostle Paul. Chapter 26, he gets transferred to Agrippa, who is a, an expert on Jewish affairs. And all of this reeks of the same condemnation that Jesus said of these leaders in Matthew 23. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, Hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appeal beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also are outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Jesus said that the religious people 
were like pretty caskets. It looks really good on the outside. We still do the same thing in our day, right? You look at them, you're like, ooh, that one's white oak. That's beautiful. Mahogany. Wonderful. But what's inside it? Well, a dead body. We still try to dress up caskets in our day. We buy expensive caskets that go in the ground and house dead bodies. That's what we do. You know what we also do? We dress up the outside of us so that other people are impressed with our appearance, impressed with our skills. But meanwhile, we're inwardly hostile to the gospel. And these people were in authority and impressive, right? But yet they are angry at the Apostle Paul here in chapter 25. So they are the ones that hated Jesus and anyone who followed him. They were all style, no substance, outwardly religious, for their own status or comfort, yet inwardly they hate the true gospel. That's what it is. Paul describes himself in a similar vein here in chapter 26, verse 4, uh, before Agrippa. Um, Paul makes his defense. He says, my manner of life from my youth, verse 4, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. So Paul is noting that he himself was religious. That's how he defends himself Attacked by religious people before a religious leader, an Agrippa. In verses 9 through 11, Paul believed that Jesus was risen from uh, the dead eventually in verses 13 and on. But 9 through 11, we see how zealous he was, excuse me, to fight the opposite direction. So Paul was actively religious when this happened in verse 13. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. We should know from this text that in the conflict between merely religious and the mission of Jesus, we should persuade religious people to be confronted by a risen Jesus. To be confronted. There's three B's on your bulletin. That's the first one. And this one is stinging for people who are going through motions. To be confronted by a risen Jesus. Jesus. That's who confronted Paul in the midst of his religiousness. He's here before King Agrippa and his sister Bernice come to Caesarea to meet the newly appointed governor Festus. Uh, Agrippa, as you remember, uh, was uh, his grandfather Herod was the one who sought the Christ child. His father Herod Agrippa I was the one who had Peter arrested and James executed and was eaten by worms in Acts 12. Several weeks ago we read that together. Needless to say, he grew up in the midst of very religious people. Paul is before him and he said, I was religious just like you at, at one point. But then this happened. Jesus intervened and revealed himself to me in the midst of my religiosity. And he showed me that all my activity was actually against God. You see that in the verse there in verse 14. He said, um, why are you persecuting me? So Paul's religious activity hurt the church. Pretty clear that he was trying to hurt the church. He was trying to see to it that none of them made it 
through worshiping this Jesus. But then the second half of this, he's saying it's hard for you to kick against the goads. So he's hurting the church, persecuting the Lord Jesus. He's hurting Jesus because Jesus is intricately tied to his church. So when you hurt the church, you pain the Lord Jesus. That's what he's saying here. But not only that, that you are hurting yourself. To kick against the goads, we don't use, nobody's ox came, you didn't goad any oxes this morning. You probably didn't. Just real quick, did anybody goad an ox? Nobody goaded an ox for breakfast? It's good, because it's not eating. Uh, but what it is, is it's a stick with a pointy thing on it, and they poke, the, poke and prod the ox to try to get it to go to do where, where they want it to go. And sometimes, in frustration, the ox will kick back. And when he kicks back against the little pointy thing that you're poking him with, it just pokes him harder. It just hurts worse. So in the modern vernacular, what's happening here is Paul, Paul is saying that Jesus confronts him and he says this religious activity is hurting the church, hurting me, and it's hurting you. Why? Because you're banging your head against the wall. That's the moder modernization of it for us. You're banging your head against the wall. That's what you're doing. He's telling a story. He was sincere in what he believed. He was very religious. And he was hurting himself. That's what he's doing. Notice what Jesus didn't say to him. Your activity was close. It was close. Let me tell you. Let me, okay, let me, you want good news or bad news? Let me give you the good news. What you're doing, there's, you were zealous. Zealous counts. Oh, and you were sincere. Sincerity counts. Oh, and then the bad thing is that you were against me. That's not what he does at all, is it? No, no, no. See, it doesn't matter if you are zealous. Zealous, zealousness, being zealous doesn't count for anything at all. Being sincere doesn't count for anything at all. As we have witnessed in our day, people do awful things because they're zealous about them and they're sincere about them. That murderer, he was really zealous and sincere. He was a sincereal killer. Thank you so much. Pity laughs. Thank you so much. No, we wouldn't say, ha, huh, he's a sincerial killer. That's, he was sincere about killing. We would say, no, sincerity doesn't matter. You're a murderer. That's what we would do. Because it doesn't matter if you put your heart into it and you really mean it. If in the, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're wrong. You're still wrong. You're still wrong. It's a foolish, losing, losing battle. Religious activity doesn't mean anything. Sincerity doesn't mean anything. If it's against Christ. If it's against Christ. If it does not connect to the Lord Jesus. Our kids just came back from camp this past week, and I got to talk to them um, after their night. It was a great time. They were a lot of fun. They're a lot cooler than I am. I think I, I upped my um, status by being there and hanging around such a fine group of people. Uh, but one of the things I talked to them about is that the church camp high, right? Like there's, there's moments of, of massive emotional height that, we could all just get swallowed up in and constrained by. But what I told him is that what, if you've connected to something real, it will make it off the property. It will make it off the property of this camp. 
if you have connected truly to the Lord Jesus, then it will make it off the grounds. Why? Because it is all about a genuine, sincere connection to Jesus. Because in the moment, in the moments they're at camp, they're pretty zealous, right? In the moments in camp, they're pretty sincere. The question is, did anybody connect to Jesus? That's, that's what we talked about on the way out. That if you did, it will make it off the property and it will take you home and it will never let you go. It won't. Because emotionalism, excitement, it all fades. Zealous, being zealous, being sincere, it all doesn't matter. People going through motions need to be confronted by a risen Jesus and connected to him. Yes, so when we leave today, how will we rate whether or not we did what we should have done as a body of believers today? We must be careful of people, as, as people who come here through religious activity. Is the religious activity that you came here to be part of actually connected to a Jesus who is alive? Or is it busyness? Is it part of your schedule to be here? Or did you come here today to be confronted by a Jesus who got out of the grave? Is that what it is? I hope that's what it is. And if it's not what it is, may this be a moment of shifting and a turning point and a head-on collision with a Jesus who is alive. Because when I was talking to them at the church camp, I mentioned, I said, I became a Christian at 10 years old at a church camp. And something had a hold of me on that day that I did not understand completely or fully, and it has not let me go until this day. It, he is still here. And he got a hold of me on that day. He holds me on this day. How can he do that if he's dead? He is alive, my friends. He is alive. So Paul encountered this Jesus and he tells this religious leader about his religious activity that actually got connected to a risen Christ. That's what he does. We have a head-on collision between rule-keeping meets resurrection. And any day, all day, and twice on Sunday, resurrection beats rule-keeping. It does. Paul was saved in verse 16, commissioned in verse 17, and in verse 18, we see the purpose, to open their eyes, the people that he would preach to, so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's what Jesus is telling him here. So in the conflict between mere religion and the mission of Jesus, we should persuade religious people, or I'm talking to the religious people in this room, you should be persuaded to be confronted by a risen Jesus, and secondly, to be forgiven. Right? I'm not just talking about like these are the messages we take to the religious people we know. No, no, no. I'm saying that you, you religious people in here, you need to know that there's a conflict and one of the conflicts is because sin, sin, religious activity runs smack dab into a risen Jesus. And what's the issue? Why, why do we need that? Because of the human condition here in 26, 18 and following. You see that. To open their eyes. Their eyes are closed. So they may turn from darkness, they're in darkness, to light, and from the power of Satan to God. So people who are blind in darkness under the power of Satan. You see that? The human condition, right there. So if you're 
going through motions, heartless motions that don't mean anything, they're not going to do anything for you disconnected from a risen Jesus. Why? Because you're blind in darkness under the power of Satan. There is no religious motion that you, my friends, could go through to unblind your eyes. To turn on the light and to get out from underneath the power of Satan. There is no religious motion that you could go through. No 12-step program that you could be a part of. Nothing that you could do. Hence why you need to be confronted by a risen Jesus. Because you need to be forgiven. You need to be forgiven. See, that's the issue. The issue is that you sinned against the holy God. The issue is that you were trying your best and living your best life now the best you could. And you living your best life now is what the Bible calls sin and rebellion against God. You do you, says the devil. Follow your heart, says every Disney movie and the devil. You need a new heart, says the Bible. And you need sin forgiven. See, the religious motions, that, that, that's why Paul is confronted by Jesus and he's called to preach and to persuade. And why, what is he going to talk about? The issue is, is that we have sinned against the holy God and we are blind in darkness and in chains to our sin. And there's nothing, absolutely nothing that we can do. There's nothing that we can do. What are we going to do? Well, there's nothing you could do, but there is something that you can receive. You see that in the text in verse 28, or 26, 18. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So faith in Christ is... Receiving from him the very fact that he can forgive your sin. <clears throat> Understanding that. He puts them among a group of people who are sanctified by that. That's what he does. You see, the, the, the issue is there in the first... So what does it is faith in me, Jesus says to him. So in the middle of this conflict, we must be confronted and forgiven. Instead of working harder, receiving something. Receiving something. The way he describes is we need to have eyes opened. We need to be out of darkness and Away from Satan to God. The result of this witnessing, according to the rest of verse 18, that Paul's doing, because he did go and preach this, and that's how he that's his prison resume. That's how he got here to where he is. Verses 21 and following. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I've had the help that comes from God, and I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets of Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to both our people and to the Gentiles. So Paul receives this gospel from the Lord Jesus. He spent his life telling everyone what God did That they need to be forgiven. Paul's telling Agrippa this story. He's talking to him and he gets the gist of what's happening. He said, are you trying to convert me? Are you trying to make me a Christian? Verse 27. 
He says, King Agrippa, you believe the prophets. I know you believe. And Agrippa says, you, you're, trying to you're trying to make me this? He says, yeah. Paul says, yeah, I want everybody to be in Christ. I mean, I don't want everybody to go to prison. Get me, don't get me wrong. I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am. So in this conflict, we should be confronted, be forgiven, and believe. 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 He closes his argument saying, with a verdict. There is a verdict. That when he gives him the gospel, he felt the pressure to do something. Gentlemen, if your wife tells you the trash is full and you walk away and you say, thank you for that piece of information, I really appreciate it. Because now I know that I can't throw anything else away until someone does something about that. And you walk away. Some of y'all are like, I did that yesterday. <laughs> when she says the trash is full, what she really means, let me explain it to you. What she really means is that you need to take out the trash. She's not going to do it. She wants you to do it. Otherwise, she wouldn't have said that. Because if she was going to do it, she just took it out. But instead of taking it out, what does she do? She says, the trash is full. Be like, wow, thank you for adding to my knowledge. I appreciate that. I am smarter now knowing that. In fact, I'll eat this banana peel as opposed to drop it in. It has protein. No, no. See, that information calls on you to do, is calling on you to do something. There's things that we are told in our life that it's just an automatic response that we ought to do something with it. That's what this is. That's what this is. When, he, when you hear in verse 23 that the Christ must suffer and by him be the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to both our people and the Gentiles. Here we are in darkness going, it's good that he proclaims light to people. It's good to know. Oh, he rose from the dead. Thank you for that factual information. My IQ is now higher knowing that his grave is now empty. No, see, that's not what the, the presentation of the gospel is at all. That's not what it is at all. Religious people look at that and go, yeah, I, am, I can pass a test on this stuff. No, no, no. You're not being asked to pass a test on this stuff. You're being persuaded by preachers commanded by God to bank your entire life on this stuff. And you hear this information that Christ died on the cross for your sin. And he was the first to, die, to rise from the dead. Don't thank me for, knowing, for telling you that. For adding to your knowledge. Don't be happy that you just know that. The devil knows that. The devil absolutely does know that. Instead, we get to the end of this trial, the portion of the trial, and Agrippa, Agrippa gets it. There's pressure on me to do something with this. You're not telling me this for my health. You're not trying to affect my blood pressure. You're wanting me to become something different. Yes, I'm wanting you to become something different. That's what the gospel does. That's what God does through the gospel in Jesus Christ. He makes you something different. And then if he did make you that, you would not be happy anymore going through motions. Going through motions. And being kind of good at some stuff that impressed some people. 
I don't talk about it a lot, and it's kind of controversial, but I'm a Cowboys fan. Sorry, Joe. And in that, we, our quarterback's kind of controversial. And a couple years ago, he, he got, they put him on blast on TV because they said that Dak Prescott inflated his stats during garbage time. And what does that mean? Some of you are like, football, I think that's the longer one, and it's brown. Yes, it's the longer one, and it's brown, it's made of leather. But what they're saying about him is that he, you look at the end of the game, and you see all the numbers, and you go, wow, he did really great. But he threw for 250 yards when they were down, when, when they were already up by four touchdowns. Right? He did all of these things, and the game kind of didn't matter. That's, what, that's the criticism of, of him, is that he is really good during pat, of padding his stats and doing all of these things when the game is either out of hand and there's no chance for them to win, or when they're winning so dominantly that they might as well put in the third stringer. He's really good when it doesn't matter. That's what they're saying. I'm saying there's some of us like that. That we really look good when it's convenient. We really look good when it's convenient. And if we're one of these religious people that, that the text is talking about, if that's you, you're padding your stats in categories of life that don't matter. I'm not saying I agree with that criticism of Dak Prescott, but I'm just saying, like, we're padding our stats in categories that don't matter. People are impressed with you if you have a spotless church attendance record. Oh, church attendance is vital, vital, so important. There are not many more things important than being a part of and plugged in and connected to God's people. You can't find too many things in life on this planet, in the scriptures, that is more important than coming to church and being a part of the church. But the people that Paul is dealing with here have really good religious records of attendance in church. They're just not connected to a risen Christ. So I'm saying you could be here and you could be here a lot. But what you need to be, you need to be confronted by a risen Jesus. You need to be forgiven because your sin needs to be dealt with. And you need to believe in him. You need to bank your entire life about him. You can pad your stats. And you can impress people. X number of days out of jail. Good for you. X number of days out of hell. Good for you. Other people are impressed with that, that you're not in jail and you're not in hell. However, there's one person who is not impressed with you padding your stats in useless categories of success, being nice, being kind, being friendly, being successful, having money, having possessions, voting the right way. Being someone of loyalty and integrity that people can count on. I'm not saying there's things wrong with that. I'm saying none of that is what makes you right with God. None of that. Only believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That is what it counts. That's what counts. So if you're not a Christian today, 
you need to throw away your resume. You need to throw away your resume. Not worry about padding the stats from impressing people. Being somebody that somebody likes. I'm not saying there's things wrong with that. But what I'm saying, I guess I'm asking, have you confronted, been confronted by a Jesus who is alive? Has that Jesus dealt with your sin? And have you banked your entire life on him? That's what I'm asking. Because you sinned against the holy God. You've rebelled. You've done your own thing. That's what you've done. And it separated you from him. God became a man in the person of Jesus who lived the perfect life. And he padded the stats of eternity. He was a stat stuffer in regards to righteousness and holiness. The Bible puts it like this. He who knew no sin. He knew, knew nothing of sin. You know what he did, though? He became sin for us. That in him we might become the righteousness of God. That when God would look at us, he would not see our stats or our records or our accomplishments or our good things. No, no, no. Throw them all away. That he might see this one thing when he looks at us, Christ. That he might see his son when he looks at us. That his account might be applied to our record. That's what he did in his son. Those are the stats that matter. Christ's sin, zero. None. That's the stat that God cares about. His sinless, spotless son. And because the sinless Savior died, my soul is counted free. For God the just was satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Are you busy? Banging your head against the wall and impressing people? Are you banging your head against the wall or are you banking it all on the sun? Let's pray today and respond to these scriptures. I'm going to be over to the side. Pastor Jonathan's going to come over here to the side. And if you want to, us to pray with you, we will. Or come see one of us on your way out. We don't care about the motions you go through. It matters where your heart is, not where you stand. Or where you kneel. Or where you cry. Or where you pray. It matters where your heart is. If you're tired of kicking against the goads and banging your head against the wall and being busy with padding stats and garbage time of life and you want your life to matter you want your sins to be forgiven you need to turn to the son of God we'd love to talk to you about that come get one of us on the way out let's pray father we uh, thank you so much for your son that he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation we thank you that in him, he, he holds all things together, that he holds our lives together. It may seem like everything is falling apart. It is not. Everything is held together at all times, in all places, by one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would save some among us from their mere religiosity. I pray that you'd put them on the mission of your son and get glory out of it as you do it. In Jesus' name, amen.